Main character Kanugi Renya, aged 94, arrives in another world with no memories of his past life. He stands still for a long time, gazing at the unfamiliar sky. Aside from that, the scenery is incredibly peaceful, with nothing seeming out of the ordinary. Renya is curious about how dangerous this world might be and wonders if his current appearance will cause any issues here. Upon discovering a bamboo sword in the equipment chest provided to him, Renya realizes he must continue to live and create a legend in this new world. But first, he needs to find a place with people. As he hesitates, unsure of which direction to go, Renya hears a scream. Following the sound, he finds a group of men harassing two girls. He shouts at them, questioning their shamelessness in bullying two girls. Seeing their bewildered looks, Renya realizes they might not understand him. One of the girls loudly tells him that she doesn't know him and urges him to run away, explaining that the matter does not concern him and that the men are royal soldiers. One of the men steps forward, warning Renya to leave and mind his own business. Renya thanks them but refuses to leave, stating that since he's here, he must act. The man laughs and asks if Renya wants to play the hero, saying he'll entertain the notion. When Renya draws his weapon, the men laugh, calling him foolish. One of them, grabbing the bamboo sword, asks what Renya can possibly do to him. In a swift motion, Renya kills the man, shocking everyone around. The others, regaining their composure, sarcastically praise Renya and dare him to come closer, though visibly shaking. Feeling they cannot defeat Renya, they prepare to attack him together. Renya smirks, relishing the familiar thrill of battle, a feeling he hasn't experienced in a long time. Even as they attack in unison, Renya easily defeats them. Holding the bamboo sword, he notes to himself that it is indeed a weapon and quite effective at that. The two girls approach to thank him for his help, introducing themselves. Renya politely asks if he has caused any trouble for them. He informs them that he is lost and wishes to leave the area quickly. Lorna Chevalier inquires how long the lost stranger has been in this world. Upon learning that Renya had only just arrived, the two girls are surprised by his strength. They inform him that they are from the Toradan Principality's expedition team and have been tasked by their guild to investigate and subdue a goblin tribe. Renya expresses his desire to help them, thus beginning his second life in this new world. The girls lead Renya back to their base, where he reflects on his death in the previous world and his subsequent reincarnation. The story begins with Renya meeting a deity who congratulates him on winning a cosmic lottery, granting him the right to reincarnate in another world. The deity explains that Renya's departure from his previous life at the age of 94 was peaceful due to old age, and thus, in his reincarnation, his body and spirit will be rejuvenated to the age of 18. Renya, annoyed, snaps back, calling the situation troublesome and demanding an explanation about this desolate place. The deity reveals that this place, in the concept of most, is what they would call heaven. The being in front of him is, more precisely, a creator deity. This deity promises to grant Renya a second life. Confused by the mention of another world, Renya asks why. The deity explains that very few souls can cross the barrier to another world, most either drift away or crash into the barrier and disintegrate. However, Renya's soul is resilient enough to endure this transition. A soul without any attachments to the old world, he is indeed a rare case. Renya inquires about the purpose of being sent to another world. The deity starts explaining in detail, but Renya interrupts, asking for a concise summary. Essentially, the deity wants him to bring resources and exert influence over the rulers of the new world. Renya understands the situation but questions how he can embark on this journey with nothing to gain. The deity casually mentions Renya's apparent fondness for food, suggesting that Eldora, his new world, has many delicious foods not found on earth. This notion of exotic delicacies sparks Renya's interest. Shaun, standing nearby, asks Renya what kind of abilities he expects to have. Shaun, noticing Renya's silence, scolds him, warning not to be careless now that they're in a safe place. While talking to the two girls, Renya suddenly moves to the window and opens it, sensing something in the forest. Shaun questions if it's a skill typical of someone lost like him, as she can't see anything. Renya calmly replies that it's just his intuition. Laura, returning from outside, confirms that there is indeed something malicious in the forest. 
Lorna suggests it might be the magic of a wizard serving the gods, known as scouting. This magic allows the caster to detect the presence of hostile entities through spirits. Hearing this, Shaun orders everyone to prepare for battle, with the rest taking refuge in a bunker. Renya thinks to himself that it must be a night ambush after dusk, as Lorna's prediction seems accurate. He feels the number of people in the forest increasing. Renya turns to assess the combat strength of his group, which includes him, the two novice adventure girls, and twelve armed civilians. He suspects the presence of the enemy's commander in the forest, acknowledging a significant disparity in power. He estimates at least fifty goblins on the opposing side. Shaun approaches Renya, asking why he seems so calm and if he is accustomed to such situations. Renya responds that he doesn't know, as he has no memories. Lorna remarks that Renya seems quite confident, suggesting they might have a chance to win. As she finishes speaking, the goblins in the forest begin to emerge. Renya internally notes that their numbers are not as high as he hoped. Shaun takes command, telling everyone not to panic and ordering the archers to start shooting. Renya, observing from behind, realizes that the villagers aren't accustomed to fighting and won't be able to hold off the goblins. He steps forward and tells them to continue shooting arrows until close combat ensues, at which point he will block the goblins' advance. Renya loudly taunts the goblins, inviting them to come closer and join the fight. Shaun, watching from below, yells at him, calling him foolish for being so reckless. Lorna inwardly curses, noting that the goblins are advancing towards their position. While fighting the goblins, Renya continually complains about the dullness of his sword. Despite the bluntness of his sword, Renya manages to defeat the goblins, who prove to be no match for him. After overcoming the nearby goblins, Renya continues to beckon the others to come closer. Shaun, frustrated by her inability to finish off the goblins and her carelessness in dropping her sword, is relieved when Lorna arrives in time to help. Shaun compliments Lorna's skill and thanks her. Lorna responds that it's too early for thanks, they should wait until they survive the current situation. Renya notices a large goblin emerging, finally a worthy opponent has appeared. He wonders if it could be the leader of the goblins. Shaun, in fear, confirms that the large goblin is indeed their leader. She warns Renya that with his broken weapon, he won't be able to defeat it, and suggests he retreat until the situation stabilizes. Renya calmly asserts that if he defeats the leader, the rest of the goblins will scatter in panic. He focuses on the goblin leader's scimitar, noting its potential for strong attacks due to its length and weight, optimized for centrifugal force. Renya takes a short while to wrest the sword from the goblin leader and then swiftly defeats him. The deity, observing Renya's combat, thinks she might have made a mistake in erasing all his memories. Even fighting against 100 goblins wouldn't be an issue for Renya's capabilities. The deity appears and asks Renya what kind of ability he would like. Renya replies that since he has been reincarnated into a younger body, he wants good health. As his hobby is eating, he needs a strong stomach. The deity muses that it's indeed a wish befitting an older person. Besides that, Renya desires a suitable ability to earn enough money. The deity considers that in terms of swordsmanship, Renya is already a master. Renya, unable to remember, asks the deity if that is indeed the case. The deity explains that his body will retain some automatic memory to a certain extent. Since in the other world there aren't many swords refined like Japanese swords, she will grant him the abilities sword forging and sword appraisal. Renya expresses interest in trying magic. The deity proudly claims that with these abilities, the power of a deity like herself is trivial. She also adds the ability to understand and speak the languages of different worlds as a bonus. Now, Renya possesses the abilities he has requested. Returning to the present world, Shaun somberly reports that only two men survived among those who stood to defend the village. Both Shaun and Lorna turn to Renya, surprised that after the battle, he still has the energy to clean up the goblin corpses. After Renya finishes, Shaun uses fire to burn the bodies. Though troublesome, cremation is necessary to prevent further goblin attacks. Renya presents the magic stones collected from the goblins' bodies, wondering what to do with them. Lorna explains that these stones serve as proof of completing their mission and must be submitted to the guild. Due to unexpected complications, their return took a few extra days, but they finally arrive back at Kukurika, a commercial city-state. 
The town's population is about 1,000, not very large, but due to its location near the most evil forest, it's protected by 2,000 elite soldiers from the Toraden Principality. Shaun comments with a smile that though the city has no special local products, it lives up to its reputation as a commercial hub, with a wide variety of medicines available. Upon reaching the gate, Renya is stopped by soldiers but is allowed entry thanks to Shaun's vouching. Lorna suggests that Renya should register with the Adventurer's Guild for future convenience. A registration card would serve as identification, like in their recent situation, and the registration process is quick. Shaun mentions they need to report to the Guild and asks if Renya wants to join them. Upon entering, the mission clerk notes that eight people were assigned to their task and asks them to report on this before proceeding, advising them to wait for a while. Shaun suggests using this waiting time to register Renya as a member. A girl inside hands him a form to fill out with his information. Shaun and Lorna express their desire for Renya to join their team. Renya asks Lorna why they chose him, wondering if there weren't more suitable people. Lorna repeats what Shaun said, Renya demonstrated remarkable abilities in the fight against the goblins, he is not the type to abandon teammates, and importantly, he did not play any tricks in front of them. As Renya suspected, both had planned to recruit him from the start. He also seeks to clarify some doubts with them. First, the circumstances of their initial encounter were strange, it was broad daylight, yet a group was harassing the two. Secondly, he questions the identities of Shaun and Lorna. Both have family names in their titles, and Shaun's name even includes a middle name. In Renya's world, individuals with such names usually come from prestigious families. He also reflects on the sword he borrowed from Shaun, noting its prominent floral design on the hilt, suggesting it's a family heirloom. Yet Shaun uses it as a spare sword, a luxury for ordinary people. Renya recalls the soldier at the gate's overly respectful reaction, which seemed unusual for just the assurance of a novice adventurer. He suspects that the fear shown must have another reason, concluding that both Shaun and Lorna have a distinguished background, known and recognizable by name and face but not publicly disclosed. And he thinks this status involves complicated affairs. Lorna admits the truth to Renya, Shaun comes from a noble lineage, and Lorna's actual role is a knight, arranged to protect Shaun. Lorna reveals she is training to defeat six mercenaries single-handedly. Renya curiously asks about Shaun's safety if she's alone. Lorna agrees, explaining that's why she wants Shaun to gradually become aware of dangers, arranging everything to let Shaun, a sheltered girl, experience the outside world through an adventure. Lorna can't dismiss these matters lightly but remains indifferent to Renya's request to join their team. However, Lorna continues to persuade Renya, saying that joining the team would help him understand everything better. Renya, feeling troubled, initially wanted a simple, peaceful life after his reincarnation. He muses that even a skilled lone adventurer can benefit from having a companion beast, making money more easily. The next day at breakfast, Renya outlines his conditions for joining the team, he wants a regular income and a proper base of operations, among other demands. Shaun looks at Lorna, unsure of what's happening. Shaun then takes Renya to meet Khalil to learn about magic. Khalil concludes that Renya has the wind attribute, making him highly compatible for learning magic. However, Renya's magic capacity is extremely low, not even half that of an average person. Khalil remarks that Renya's magic color is not an issue, noting that having such clear and beautiful blue light is exceedingly rare. She observes the orb for a moment and comments on its small point of light. Normally, the entire glass orb would light up and be fainter, with magical skills making it brighter. There is a record of a hero whose touch caused such intense light that it shattered the glass orb. Khalil explains that magical capability increases gradually with use, depending on the method of practice. However, with a starting point like Renya's orb, she doesn't expect much. Renya inquires about effective training methods. After receiving payment from Shaun, Khalil instructs Renya to extend his hand. Renya's system notifies him that the light magic attribute has been bestowed upon him. Khalil teaches him a spell, assuring that simply reciting what she instructs will produce the orb. To increase magical power, rigorous and consistent training is necessary for effective results. Renya then asks about his wind magic attribute. Khalil mysteriously states that even with her guidance, he wouldn't be able to use it well at present. 
She advises him to train until he accumulates a significant amount of magical power, at which point she will grant him wine magic, for a fee, of course. On the way back, Shaun is unusually cheerful, singing and expressing surprise that someone like Renya has weaknesses. Renya playfully hits Shaun on the head, telling her not to generalize and to put the matter aside for now. He asks if she can wait a few days before taking on a new mission. Renya is perplexed by his lack of memories and the strange terms filling his mind. He finds the words of the deity child confusing. Shaun, walking beside him, quietly remarks that people who are lost are hard to understand. Renya inquires about a place where he can comfortably train to understand and control his abilities better. Shaun suggests a location she often uses for training, with moderately strong magical beasts and dry terrain, ideal for practice. Following Shaun's directions, Renya quickly heads to the northern mountains. He notes that the area is secluded enough to practice without causing trouble. Shaun mentioned it would take a few hours on foot, but Renya doesn't feel it's that far. Signs of destruction are still visible around. At the moment, Renya feels neither tired or breathless, feeling extremely confident about his physical abilities. During his training, Renya faints, fortunately being rescued by a passerby. Renya ponders if his fainting was due to a lack of stamina, despite not being naturally talented. He cautiously observes the girl who appeared beside him. The girl assures Renya there's no need for defense, as she's just a merchant concerned with trade. Renya is skeptical, noting that she claims to be a merchant yet carries nothing with her. The girl introduces herself as Kikiso, a great merchant traveling across Osaka to gather items for sale. Meeting here must be fate, she says, and wants to show Renya her goods. Kikiso mentions she deals in everything from weapons to clothing and is sure to have something suitable for Renya. As Renya looks for a way to escape the conversation, Kikiso presents a sword made from barrel dragon teeth. He wonders how she suddenly produced those weapons but feels less threatened. When Renya picks up a Japanese sword, Kikiso explains it was left by a lost person and is only of aesthetic value. In other words, it's practically useless and hard to sell. Kikiso laughs, saying if sold to someone with an eye for it like Renya, she would be delighted. Renya, regretfully, informs her he has no money. Kikiso suggests a barter, offering to trade for the bamboo sword Renya carries. She deems the bamboo sword more suitable for a showy merchant than for combat. After completing the trade, Kikiso departs, promising to meet Renya again. As she leaves, she advises Renya that if fainting due to insufficient magical power, he should train in a room or somewhere safe. She assures him that even though he fainted today, with his potential, his skills will improve rapidly. After Kikiso's departure, she quickly reports to a deity that her plan was successful. Renya returns to receive a new mission. A new type of dungeon creature has been discovered, and their task is to subdue it. The Goan creature, recently found inhabiting abandoned rock caves and non-dungeon caverns, absorbs all energy from its surroundings. Shaun explains that even if creatures are released, they would be absorbed by the Goan, making their conquest mission extremely dangerous. Shaun informs them that for this mission, they will be joining forces with other teams, totaling four teams for the conquest. They plan to travel using guild magic, taking two days for transit and another two days for searching. Shaun asks Renya if he has planned every step. They are set to depart tomorrow, and will meet the other teams tonight. That evening, as arranged, Renya's group arrives at the gathering place. Harutsu Raisen, leader of the Crimson Lotus Leaders team and a level B adventurer skilled in dual swordsmanship, probably the most esteemed person present, stands up and surveys the room, noting that everyone seems to have arrived. Renya inquires about him to Shaun, who explains Harutsu's background and skills. Shaun points out Zest Fatarity, the leader of the Dewey Knights team. Despite his poor behavior earning him a level C ranking, his actual combat capability is closer to level B. The last team, Sneak Peaks, is led by A.Z. Hond, a level D adventurer known for defeating four enemies using his magical singing. Renya comments on Shaun's detailed knowledge. Shaun is familiar with all the teams in the town, especially those participating in this mission. Zest, noticing their conversation, loudly interrupts and inquires if Renya is only with two people. Losing patience, he demands to know their intentions. Renya explains that there's one more member who couldn't make it as she's preparing for tomorrow. 
Zest angrily asks if Renya is joking with him. Renya apologizes for any inconvenience, insisting he only intends to work. Zest angrily calls Renya a fool, questioning who is late. When asked about his team's name, Renya admits they haven't chosen one yet. The crowd starts to laugh, questioning how a level F like Renya could be part of this mission. Zest mocks them for being a small, level F team, insinuating they're trying to leech off others. In response to his jeers, Zest grabs a bottle of wine and throws it, but Renya quickly moves Shaun out of harm's way. After being attacked a second time, Renya sharply retaliates. Renya states that he came only to meet the others, not to create such an atmosphere. Zest challenges him, asking who the real cause is. Renya calmly suggests that if Zest blames him, he is willing to disband and continue with the mission independently, not requiring any more support. Renya insists his team will operate on their own, allowing the others to do as they wish. Hirutsu agrees, noting that provoking each other isn't conducive to effective action. AZ Hond also declares he doesn't need help, finding it more of a hindrance. Renya decides to leave, declaring that the meeting is over for the day. Zest mockingly warns Renya to be extra careful in the dungeon. After leaving, Renya apologizes to Shaun. It was his first time as an adventurer, and he asks her to temporarily follow his lead. Soon, the three set off in a carriage to the dungeon. While Shaun drives, Lorna questions Renya's intentions, asking if he plans to worsen their relations with the other teams. Renya explains it's absurd to expect a fighting spirit from them. He was merely assessing the differences in rank and searching for an optimal approach. Lorna, curious about this optimal method, listens as Renya vaguely describes it as expansive. He emphasizes the importance of not engaging in combat with the other teams, especially when they cannot be relied upon. Renya reiterates that they should act on the predefined days and then claim the treasure. Lorna covers her face, suggesting they're leeching off others. Renya disagrees, stating that since they're no longer fighting together, it's vital to find an effective strategy quickly. Lorna realizes it's a mission she's not fully prepared for but agrees to proceed with Renya's plan, aiming to protect Shaun. Shaun, from the driver's seat, asks if they're having fun. She then turns to Lorna, commenting that she's been driving continuously. Lorna explains it's a punishment for Shaun taking on the mission independently. Surprised, Shaun questions if the punishment wasn't already dealt with. While they continue their banter, Renya locates the dungeon entrance. He asks if camping so close to it is safe. Lorna assures him it's fine, as they are not in an area densely populated with monsters over ten years old. In this dark dungeon, there aren't many monster spawnings, so monsters rarely appear. Looking at the small hill ahead, it should be easier to spot. You think that even with poor visibility, it's safer inside the forest. Renya hasn't given up and continues to say that the hill, being so visible and even having stairs, seems like it's made to facilitate the meat-eating monsters. Then he looks at the tent and notes there's no sign of resistance. Lorna, hearing this, suggests they should have someone keep watch. At the same time, Renya takes the opportunity to prepare a lavish meal for the three of them. Both are impressed by the spread of food. Renya says he couldn't prepare everything due to the rush. Shaun compliments that this is more than sufficient, as other groups only have dried meat and hard bread. Renya reminds them to be wary of zest while keeping watch. He looks deceivingly harmless, but there had been previous conflicts between them. Renya suspects he might do something detrimental to them, and for now, can only hope Zest stays away. Both, after hearing Renya's analysis, seem to understand. The next morning, they wake up to find Zest's gang has disappeared. Hirutsu asks his subordinate if they've really run away, how frightening. He guesses they might have gone to destroy Dangi and KOA. Everyone starts contemplating this theory. If KOA is destroyed, the reward changes. Also, investigating in such a young Dangoan wouldn't take much time, a single team with some strength could manage it. The rest are angry at Zest's group, feeling underestimated and that the group has gained an unfair advantage. Hirutsu looks at Renya and asks if he isn't upset about losing 10 gold coins. Renya calmly replies no, as the amount, though significant, is worth it if it serves his purpose. Hond empathizes, even wanting to send Zest a thank you card. Renya suddenly says those guys might also fail, and by then, they would have finished their task. 
Thanks to them, the number of monsters has decreased, and they just need to avoid the monsters that defeated Zest's group. Harutsu looks at them for a moment and asks if they have no intention of helping. Both Renya and Hond unanimously say they have no such intention. They apologize for letting the others go first, but their actions hold no duty or reason for them. Hond adds that if they die from wounds inflicted by an enemy, it would be even more grateful. After the two leave, Lorna approaches Renya to ask if everything is okay. According to Harutsu's group, they expect results by noon. Renya says that since his group has decided to wait, there's no need to rush anything. Renya once again seeks out Han to ask about his group's status. Harutsu's group has already pursued Zest's gang into Dangian. Han sighs with relief, saying that it's thanks to this that he can relax like he is now. Renya agrees, noting that with the noisy ones gone, he can enjoy his breakfast leisurely. Taking advantage of the calm, Renya decides to share a warm breakfast with them. Hond curiously asks where Renya got the ingredients to cook for so many. Renya has a space bag that can hold a lot of water and ingredients. Anyway, with excess ingredients, he plans to prepare both breakfast and lunch. Hond interrupts, proposing a trade for both meals. He promises to teach Renya basic magic. Renya initially refuses, as it would mean a loss for Hond. But for Hond, having food and drink in this place is paramount, he's already put his teammates through enough. Hearing this, Renya agrees to the exchange. Hond places a talisman on Renya's forehead and recites a spell. Shortly after, Hond announces that Renya can now use a small fireball spell, provided he has enough magical power. Renya recalls a fortune teller saying he had no talent for magic, but with practice, he could use it. Hond, after a long pause, looks at Renya in resignation. It's true that using magic increases magical power, but it's not a matter of overnight. No matter how talented, it's impossible to increase it hundreds of times with just training. After resting, both Renya's and Hans' groups gather to prepare for their mission. Renya reminds everyone to double-check before descending. Shaun informs the group that the first objective is to investigate inside according to the mission. Next is to check on the two teams that went in before. The condition for retreat is if the earlier teams are in a desperate situation or if they find the cause. Renya says they still can't decide what lies ahead. Considering their limited experience and actual achievements, they shouldn't act rashly. Hond looks at him, agreeing with what he just said. Renya thinks to himself how Hond can still smile, realizing the world is indeed full of terrifying things. He asks Hond again to confirm if he really wants Renya to command both teams. After receiving an affirmative from Hond, Renya starts arranging the formation. Their journey deeper into the dungeon begins, with each step into the unknown. Renya looks around, nothing unusual, just that this Dangian has a KOA, unlike the usual ones. Hond points out a strange door, wondering why it's placed here. Lorna notes that the time for creature spawns has passed. They start to see dried bloodstains, a lot of them. Hond puzzles over whether it's the blood of the teams that went in before. Renya thinks it's highly probable, given the timing. Shaun looks at the door, suggesting that beyond it, they might find the cause. But it's unbelievable that the two groups lost their lives in such a shallow place. Renya feels a continuous dreadful sensation from inside the corner, but that alone isn't enough to prove anything. Hond believes this isn't reason enough for them to retreat, they still need to find the other two groups. They unanimously decide to move deeper, and a smell of rotting flesh hits them. Inside the room, a person sitting on a chair smiles at them. Renya is shocked to see that the person has grey skin and brown hair, a demon. Lorna admits it's her first time seeing one a race with strength several times that of humans and very aggressive. They can't just engage in swordplay with him. Hond thinks this guy is tricky, and they should quickly retreat. The demon, hearing this, tells them not to leave so soon, as that would be disrespectful to the host. Shaun yells, asking if about eleven people have come here, but where is the adventurer? The demon summons newly experimented zombies, and they easily recognize one as Hirutsu. He says he's been collecting elements for his experiment from those coming from the continent. Thanks to many people, he's been able to conduct his experiment. After finishing his sentence, he orders the zombies to attack. Kikiso, after bringing the bamboo sword back to her god, is extremely angry. She urges her master to hurry up, 
questioning why he rejected magic. She shows him the sword, explaining the effort it took to retrieve it from the lower world. But now, her master refuses to add the unbreakable attribute to it. The god tells Kikiso she's being too noisy, wondering why she's repeating herself. Kikiso asks again why Renya's bamboo sword was given the indestructible attribute. The god thinks for a moment, happily explaining that adding such a property to a bamboo sword seemed unique. The fragile bamboo sword would become extremely hard, so it wouldn't have the power of wood. Even if it's hard, it wouldn't cause discomfort, and she also wants to think about how to make it shine. Normally, the hard part of a bamboo sword isn't the most important. This way, one can become a master of Japanese swords without needing to sharpen it often. If it's a divine weapon, it's necessary to carry such equipment. The indestructible bamboo sword given to Renya is because living in his world will be much more interesting. Kikiso yells, frustrated with her master's unpredictable temperament, making it impossible for her to enjoy herself. Moreover, she is a full jirial, not a weakling like Renya. The god tells Kikiso to calm down, explaining that not just the bamboo sword, but even Japanese swords are influenced by their wielder. Moreover, a professional like Renya could use it. Anyway, the god has given Renya a feature so great that it cannot lose to that blade. The god calmly tells Kikiso that whatever will happen, will happen. Kikiso feels helpless, saying that's exactly why she's worried, she doesn't know what's become of that guy now. When Renya encounters the demon race, he uses the Japanese sword to fight. The demon quickly notices the problem with the sword. He asks Renya if the transforming sword can also perform special techniques. Just now, he clearly saw the sword break his magic. The demon laughs, pointing at the sword, extremely interested in it and wants to borrow it from Renya for a while. Renya says he doesn't know and refuses. He tells the demon that he traded the sword with a merchant, and if he wants to know more, he should find out himself. The demon, dissatisfied, calls Renya back, arguing that it would be quicker to show him here. If Renya won't show him, then he has no other choice. As soon as he finishes speaking, the demon attacks Renya with his dexterous hands. Renya is momentarily surprised but then curses the demon as trash. He quickly counterattacks with his sword, cutting off parts of the demon's body. Seeing the zombies reminds Shaun of the day she saw this mission. There are many monsters around Kukurika town, and she heard that many skilled adventurers were coming. Shaun wanted to join them, but she never imagined that the adventurers she admired would all become zombies. She wonders if they will end up the same. Then, she resolutely stabs them with her sword, continuously apologizing. Lorna reminds her that the toxic gas is thickening. Lorna will focus on chanting, so she relies on Shaun for the rest. She thinks the peace they had earlier is now more precious than ever. After defeating the demon, Renya can't stop looking at his sword. He thinks this time it's really over, it's completely different from a regular Japanese sword. It fits his hand perfectly, the blade is incredibly sharp, and it can even break magic. Renya reassures himself that whatever happens will happen, after all, he's already dead. He goes to find his teammates, helping Shaun by killing one. Shaun asks how he is doing with the demon. Renya calmly says it seems he has killed him. Setting that aside, he wants to check on Hond's group. Hond approaches and reports they are also done, with a few injured and heavily poisoned, asking for Lorna's help. As they assess the situation, Shaun and Lorna are suddenly captured. Then the voice of the demon surprises them, commenting on how unexpected it is for Renya to have come this far. Renya retorts that the demon is as persistent as a leech, thinking he had completely eliminated him. The demon laughs loudly, explaining that what was destroyed and burnt was just his corpse. His real body can create duplicates. Renya curses him for being such a nuisance. Even the demon's clothes and glasses have been fully restored. As Renya speaks, the demon attacks him, but Shaun timely blocks it. The demon laughs, asking if he is Renya, finding him very interesting. He comments on Renya's demeanor and strength, guessing his actions and decisions are very decisive. He asks why Renya is fighting so hard for those people, if he is a hero blessed by the gods. Renya replies he doesn't know about being a hero, but from the beginning, that title should have been used for the demon, who falsely names himself and acts presumptuously. Renya notices the wall behind slowly disappearing, or more accurately, being absorbed into the demon. 
he realizes the entire room is actually part of the demon's body. The demon, Amira Raja, laughs loudly, explaining his body is made of cells that can transform and change shape. The damage Renya inflicted earlier is insignificant to him. While Amiru is engrossed in talking about himself, Renya rescues the two captives. Amiru asks if Renya is ready, indicating it's time to start the battle. Renya counts Amiru's tentacles but suddenly, it becomes pitch black around them. Amiru attacks silently in the dark, then loudly praises Renya's skill. He turned off all the lights and even threw a feint, but Renya was able to dodge just by hearing the sound of the wind. Renya thinks about how Amiru can even control the light source. He finds Amiru's tentacles extremely annoying, they move erratically, and even if cut, they likely regrow. Moreover, a direct hit from them could be serious. Shaun just manages to block with her sword, while Lorna and Hond take direct hits. They need immediate first aid, or it could be fatal. Renya sees that the rest of Hond's group can no longer fight, and the poisonous gas is everywhere. He knows he's at a disadvantage but thinks he just needs to hold out until he can kill Amiru. Amiru admits he was a bit scared when Renya cast spells in quick succession without chanting. It seems Renya only knows basic magic. Amiru mockingly says it appears Renya wasn't properly taught and then mysteriously tells him not to disappoint. Renya is surprised by Amiru's increased speed and keeps dodging. Amiru expresses pity for Renya, asking where his consecutive spell casting without chanting has gone. Renya thought a direct attack would work, but Amiru counters with magic. Renya thinks he needs to calm down and figures his only option is to slash and burn Amiru. Kikiso, observing everything, asks the god if this is okay, referring to the person named Renya. Renya isn't being overwhelmed, indeed, the demon is still stronger. The god tells Kikiso she's worrying too much over a small matter. She responds that she has already blessed Renya. Kikiso mentions the ability her master granted, even if Renya fights with all his might, the demon won't take it seriously. The god calmly states that Renya's agility and strong will are from his previous life. Kikiso is surprised, realizing the god hasn't yet granted Renya's reincarnation power. The god has given him some magic and physical strength, but they are just equal. The god tells Kikiso to take care of it herself if she's concerned. Kikiso hesitantly says she thought all humans had similar abilities. With no other choice, the god reveals Renya's identity. Renya is the 14th generation head of the Kungugi family, a master swordsman. Fond of swordsmanship since childhood, he showed exceptional talent at 13. At 15, he was known as the wandering swordsman, participating in brutal battles and even traveling to mainland China. He was a member of a powerful underworld organization. Renya became famous for eliminating many dark elements in society. He later joined the world war, repeatedly facing death, and was the sole survivor on a battlefield littered with corpses. Countless people died by his hand before his reincarnation. With just one strike, Renya killed his opponents, leading to rumors that he possessed demonic strength. Thus, he was referred to as Ken Ki, the demon swordsman. The god says that after reincarnation, Renya might be slowly adapting to the culture and combat techniques here. But in his youth, he had extensive battlefield experience. The god reassures Kikiso not to worry. In a soft voice, Kikiso asks if her master doesn't intend to save Renya. Meanwhile, below, the demon is losing his composure, shouting at Renya for doing well and promising to show his true power. Renya internally curses the demon's madness. When the demon sees Renya not responding, he asks what he should show him next. Renya, losing his patience, raises his sword and declares that this will be the last time the demon can smile. The demon still laughs, asking if Renya will give it his all, to which he responds that he must also go all out. Renya decides to first slash the demon's tentacles. Amiru, still laughing, comments on Renya's predictable fighting style. Renya doesn't reply but waits for Amiru to reveal a weakness and then attacks it. Amiru, in pain, asks if Renya has figured out his plan. Renya, seeing the demon nearing death, answers that he was waiting for a counterattack to find an opening to finish him off. Amiru finds it amusing that his defeat comes at the hands of a human using only basic magic. Renya asks if Amiru wants a merciful death, he'll give him the least painful one but still needs to ensure he can't regenerate, probably by chopping him into pieces. Amiru, 
lying weakly on the ground, proposes a deal. He continues, saying he can't fight anymore. From now on, he will withdraw, but Renya still has the strength to kill him. Amiru urges Renya to consider his teammates, all are injured and poisoned, wondering how long they can endure to reach the city. He has the crucial ingredient for the antidote. If Renya agrees to spare him, he'll heal everyone here and give Renya the dungeon's core. That's what everyone came here for. Renya has one condition, help him get everyone back. Hond asks what happened while they were unconscious. Renya says he's written a report to the guild about the demon's human experiments and his regenerative abilities. He's also handed over the dungeon's core to the guild. They've been generously compensated, so there's nothing to worry about. Renya informs everyone that the guild has given him the reward for all four groups. So, in total, it's 34 gold coins, plus 60 for the dungeon's core, and another 6 for the information he provided, making a total of 100 gold coins he's holding for everyone. Hond says he's not talking about that. He can't believe Renya is just a rank F. With just a bit of magic and purely sword skills, Renya managed to defeat the demon with basic magic. Hond wonders what kind of monster Renya really is. At the same time, Renya is still recalling what happened earlier. Amiru told him that he had already healed his teammates. He also reminded Renya to quickly take his teammates and leave, as they would soon wake up. Holding the stone in his hand, Renya asks if it's the core, what people call a magic stone. Amiru informs him that it's only half, truthfully, Amiru himself is the real core. What Renya is holding is just a backup. To Amiru, that stone is now as good as garbage. But he knows the foolish humans will never realize this. Moreover, Amiru wants Renya to join him, promising him things far beyond human reach. Renya warns him to stay away, or he won't be responsible for his actions. Renya, thinking back, feels that talking to Amiru was truly a headache. He hopes that letting Amiru go won't cause problems later. Hond waits for a long time but doesn't get a response from Renya. If Renya doesn't want to talk about what happened, he won't press him. Meanwhile, Hond wants to know if Renya is sure about distributing the reward to everyone, as they didn't really do anything for Renya. Renya interrupts, saying it's not true that they didn't do anything. Hond's teammates took care of the zombies for him, and if it weren't for the fireball spell Hond taught him, he would have been gone long ago. Renya repeats that they are alive thanks to everyone's help. He wants to thank Han's team members. Besides, he doesn't need that much money, but Han's teammates do. Renya reminds him of his intention to disband the group. Han thinks the amount should be enough for their adventure. He also believes the recent mission was too much for his team. After all, they are just ordinary people, it's best to let them return to their previous jobs. The amount on the table should be enough for them to continue living comfortably. Renya agrees that letting them go back is the right decision. Han stands up and thanks Renya, expressing his gratitude for what he has done. He informs everyone that he plans to go to an adventurer's training school as a teacher. After settling everything, Shaun asks Renya to go outside with her. They head to Hermit's grave. Renya suggests that Shaun should have said they were going outside to train, to avoid misunderstandings. Suddenly, Shaun loudly wonders what it even means anymore. Renya looks back at her, puzzled. Shaun speaks softly, saying she will cause trouble for him. She wanted to help in the dungeon but couldn't do anything. She repeats that while Renya can do everything, she is of no help. Renya comforts her, saying he doesn't think that way. She wants to become stronger to stand alongside him in battle. Renya realizes she wants his help in training. He admires her and tells her so. Shaun misunderstands, asking him not to make fun of her. Renya calmly says it's natural for teammates to train together, and he is serious. He appreciates Shaun's determination and will pay attention to how she fights. Renya asks her to try and land a hit on him, promising to help her. He reminds her to be quick and not to make unnecessary movements. Focus on striking one point and increase speed. Pointless moves only complicate things, analyze the opponent's movements. Renya observes and reminds Shaun to block the opponent and only attack when sure to cause damage. Both are surprised when they continuously attack but can't land a hit, even though they never fought each other before. Shaun thinks Renya will read all her moves. She begins to doubt his combat experience on the battlefield. 
Renya tells her to focus, as no matter how many times she attacks, it's useless if she doesn't hit him. He wants her to pay attention to the opponent, anticipating their moves. Renya decides it's his turn to counterattack, just when an orge appears, surprising them. Renya, seeing it for the first time, asks Sham why it's here and if it's strong. Normally, ogres aren't very strong, and even Shaun can handle them. But it's the first time she's seen such a big orge. Renya understands it's an opponent Shaun hasn't faced before or something similar. Renya points to the orge, telling Shaun it's a good opportunity for her to gain experience. Shaun hesitates, saying no, but Renya keeps urging her on. Shaun realizes she can't keep avoiding challenges and needs to be stronger. She shouts her desire to be as strong as Renya and charges at the orge. Renya sits back and observes Shaun applying what he taught her in the fight. After a while, when Shaun struggles, Renya steps in and finishes off the orge. Upon their return, Lorna informs them that she has found a suitable house for them. The three visit the house located outside the commercial area of Kakurika. Renya looks at the house and silently praises it, thinking it's a good villa. Shaun asks how Lorna found it. Some people showed her the location, and she thought it would be suitable for Renya. Renya suggests that he and Lorna can inspect the villa themselves. Shaun disagrees, saying it should be fair since they are in the same team and insists on checking it out together. After viewing the house, they find the rooms a bit large but overall quite good. Lorna feels the place is too big for just the three of them. Renya sees no issue with it, saying the house has everything he needs and he doesn't like fussing over things. Renya plans to buy the house for 60 gold coins, paying 40 up front and earning the rest later. Lorna doesn't like being in debt, but it's the best way to secure a home. Renya, curious, comments that such a significant discount on real estate usually means there's something about it. Lorna laughs it off, then asks Shaun if she agrees. Shaun has no objections, as the place is spacious enough for the whole team to live together. After making the decision, Renya sets up a tent in the garden. Shaun wonders why he's doing this, is it because they haven't paid yet? Renya calmly asks if Shaun hasn't heard that the villa might be haunted. If they try to occupy it, they might be haunted by ghosts, which explains the low price. However, Renya first wants to check if it's true. Hearing this, Shaun cries out in horror, questioning why they should stay there if it's haunted. Renya asks why she's afraid, she's not even scared of monsters. Lorna, wanting to add to the excitement, tells the legend of the house. A few years ago, a wealthy merchant lived there with his family. He was kind to his workers and clients, paying more for items than others, which made many people want to work for him. One day, the boyfriend of a maid sneaked into the house looking for her and witnessed the merchant killing several people with scissors. The merchant was later executed for serial murder. However, the spirits of those he killed still linger in the house. After Lorna finishes the story, the sky darkens and several ghosts begin to appear. Renya calmly notes that they really don't have physical bodies. He had heard that ghosts can't be killed, but he wants to see if that's true. Surprisingly, Renya finds he can slash them, feeling as if he had blocked a spell earlier. Discovering something interesting, Renya goes around the house slashing the spirits. Soon, all the spirits disappear, and Renya finds a young girl with pointed ears. Later, Lorna comes to check the noise and finds the girl unconscious. She recognizes her as an ELF and recalls rumors about such a being in the city. With pointed ears and a maid's outfit, living in an abandoned house and repelling intruders, she guesses the girl might be a Shiruki. A Shiruki is a type of spirit or soul, often appearing as a child and protecting its dwelling. Anyone trespassing is driven away with magic and illusions. Shaun recalls reading about this in her childhood. If she remembers correctly, a Shiruki will bless you if they like you, or attack if they don't. They realize that the ghosts were just trying to protect the house and the girl was behind everything. Shaun laughs, saying they have identified the ghost, as real ghosts don't exist. The girl wakes up, sees the three people, and starts crying, asking them to leave as it's her house. Renya tells the girl to calm down, saying they won't harm her. He introduces himself and explains their plan to live in the house. The girl yells that she was born there, it's her house, and only the owner is allowed to live there. The problem is that the original owner of the house has long passed away, and the girl has no memory of the owner. 
Therefore, it's possible that she was born after the execution of the wealthy merchant. Shiruki live and serve their owners for life, without an owner, they cannot exist. This girl, having never had an owner, made protecting the house her purpose. She shouts that even without an owner, she must protect the house where she was born. Renya notes that the girl looks very weak and asks if she can survive without an owner. Hesitantly, she admits she can't, she used up all her magical power creating Satsuki. Renya gently asks if he can become the owner of the house. He promises to make the house better than it is now if she accepts him as her owner. Lorna laughs, saying she knows Renya means well, but his words sound rather eerie. The girl whispers that she failed to protect the house and has no strength left to do so. Renya assures her to just trust him. Thanks to her help, the house has quickly become lively. Renya names her Frau Verb, a name of a deity he read about in a book. Soon after moving in, Renya welcomes his first guest. Hond compliments the nice house Renya has acquired, admiring that he could own a villa at such a young age. Hond looks at Frau and jokes about getting a fairy as a bonus. Renya complains about the burden of debt for the house, unlike Hond who has a stable job. He's still risking his life exploring to make ends meet. Hond says he came to ask for a favor, something that only Renya can help with. He talks about a school for adventurers, where he's teaching nobles children. A problem has arisen at the school. During a sparring match, one of the teachers made a mistake and lost to a student. This has caused the students to lose interest in attending classes. Renya comments that such a situation seems quite rare. Han speaks softly, saying it's not exactly like that. Most of the teachers at the school are people who have lost their close companions, just like him. Others are older adventurers who have retired, or there are various other reasons. But with their experience, losing to a 15 or 16 year old is unlikely. However, it's different for noble children who come from lines of elite knights or wizards, trained by their parents from a young age. They are very strong in both physical combat and magic, some of the most elite in humanity. Renya understands that it's hard to teach someone who is stronger than you. He directly asks Hond if he wants him to go there and discipline those kids. Hond senses Renya's lack of interest in the matter. Renya asks if it wouldn't be good for students to be able to beat their teachers. Hond explains that the issue is these students have started to disrespect other classes. He describes his team members functioning as tankers to protect wizards, who can't defend themselves while casting spells. Therefore, the only one who could handle this situation is Renya, a swordsman who also uses magic without chanting. Hond mentions that the school will pay one gold coin as a reward and offer access to the teleportation gate. Renya finds the offer reasonable, even though he doesn't currently need it. Hond offers to pay double if Renya agrees. Renya, having a rough idea about the situation and seeing no loss in it, agrees to Hond's request. Hond is one of the few people Renya considers a friend. Renya looked at the school in front of him, which resembled more of a fortress. Hond explained that since its establishment, Kukuria had been considered a border town adjacent to other continents. At the same time, it was also the first line of defense protecting people from the threats of the demon continent. Therefore, even if the city walls were to collapse, the school would still be regarded as the final line of defense in this area. After hearing this, Renya replied, indicating that while people struggled to protect the city, the nobles comfortably relied on the teleportation gates. Hond, avoiding any comment, led Renya to the training area. The strongest magical technologies were installed around eight pillars inside. Hond informed him that inside this arena, if Renya were to suffer a critical hit, the attack would be instantly nullified, and he would be thrown out of the arena immediately. While the two were talking, a group approached. Hond pointed at them, saying they were the class Renya needed to teach a lesson. The short-haired girl walking behind was their teacher, named Riaris, whom he had mentioned before. The two arrogant ones leading the group were their targets this time. The loud-mouthed boy was Auron Schmazer, the son of General Schmazer serving in the Duchy of Triden. And the curly-haired blonde girl was Natalia Fatal, a lady from an influential branch of the Fatal ducal family in the region. After identifying each person, Hond asked Renya to help him discipline them. The two had used their influence to arrange this situation. He explained that Riaris was supposed to spar with all the students in her class. 
However, after they had exhausted her by continuously making her fight other students, the two revealed themselves. Han thought that even with a setup, they stood no chance against Riaris in a fair fight. Renya asked if that meant he just needed to give them a memorable beating. Hond, observing the situation on the field, did not respond to Renya. Riaris was trying to shout to get the students to listen to her, as they were still in class. The kids, not hearing a word, were scoffing. Auron loudly criticized the school's foolish policies for making them waste money on hiring such useless people. They wanted to experience intense training like in the military. Natalia skeptically questioned what Riaris could teach them. Unable to tolerate their words any longer, Renya went down to the field to scold the brainless bunch who knew nothing but to bark. Renya then went to tell Riaris that he had been sent by Han to lend her a hand. Auron, angered, approached to inquire about Renya's sudden appearance and his audacity to scold them. Renya unhesitatingly revealed his F rank. He explained that he was there because their attitude was intolerable, and the school had hired him to teach them a lesson. Upon hearing Renya's words, the students focused on his F rank and scoffed at him. Unbothered, Renya waited for them to finish before provoking them to challenge him, intending to defeat each arrogant individual. As usual, the young maid of the Kanugi house, Frau, woke up very early. Her day began with preparing breakfast, striving to cook with the flavors that Renya had taught her. Afterward, her task was to wake everyone in the house, including her master. She knew that no matter how she called him, Renya would refuse to get up. To Frau, it appeared as if she was simply trying to wake him, but in reality, she was directing her killing intent towards Renya. This method always made him jump out of bed instantly. Startled by her call, Renya asked Frau what she was doing, mentioning how her approach always gave him a scare. Frau laughed loudly, saying it was his fault for not waking up despite her calls. Then, there was Shaun, who was no different from Renya in ignoring wake-up calls. Frau was determined to find a way to wake Shaun up, but the last person always gave her a headache. Even as a perfect maid like Frau, she always faced a troubling issue every morning related to Lorna. Once everyone was awake, they would have breakfast together. As usual, Frau would cheerfully see the three off at the gate and wish them a good day. While the master was away, Frau continued to work diligently. With the things living in the basement assisting her, cleaning didn't take much of her time. She knew it was Renya's mana that made these mundane tasks easier, but she kept this secret from Shaun, aware of her fear of ghosts. During dinner, Frau showed Renya some stones, surprising him. He asked if they were magical stones she had bought. Frau bashfully denied, informing him that she had grown stronger and could now create magical stones by herself. Frau had reclaimed the excess mana from her master, Renya, and crystallized it. Seeing that everyone was still confused, she further explained. The house was powered by Renya's mana, like the hot water and refrigerator, but his mana was so abundant that there was a surplus. Frau admitted that a significant amount of mana was lost during the crystallization process and that the quality was not yet high. Looking at Renya, she promised to practice creating higher quality stones. Then, with a smile, she suggested that Renya could use these stones for his purposes. Renya asked why she didn't use them for her own purposes. Frau immediately refused, saying it was Renya's mana and he could also use it to pay off debts. Renya silently scolded himself for letting a young girl like Frau handle his debts. Unable to resist her expectant eyes, he accepted the stones. Frau joyfully said she would do everything for her master, like how she discovered an uninvited guest the night before. Despite being stabbed with a poison knife, she managed to send the intruder to hell. Renya, upon hearing this, assumed it was someone from the school seeking revenge. He felt bored as there were no longer any decent tasks for them. However, thanks to Frau, they had many magical stones. In the end, he decided to pay off his rent with whatever money he earned. On his way home, Renya encountered the young merchant Kikiso. However, he couldn't quite remember her name. Kikiso, irritated, told him not to underestimate the merchant network and recounted several of his deeds. For instance, how he was a famous, violent C-rank adventurer feared by many, or how he, a commoner, dealt with nobles efficiently. The latest news was that he had beaten the children of nobles at their school. Kikiso mentioned she was aware of many rumors about Renya's achievements. Suddenly recalling something, she asked Renya about the sword she gave him. Renya, 
surprised, loudly asked what it was made of. It was strangely durable, even cutting through magic and souls. Hearing this, Kikiso said she was also curious about it. She speculated that the sword came from a distant place and might be enhanced by special magic. Renya questioned how Kikiso could call herself a merchant when she knew nothing about it. Renya dismissed the topic and asked Kikiso why a merchant like her came to this town. She widened her eyes and revealed that she was actually looking for him, proposing a lucrative business deal. After hearing her out, Renya returned home to announce that they would be heading to the land of the elves. Shaun and Lorna looked at Renya, wondering what silly idea he had come up with now. Renya, losing his patience, shouted that he wanted to eat rice, hot steaming white rice. Lorna urged him to calm down and explain everything from the beginning. Kikiso clarified to the two that what the wanderers call rice is also found here, but it's called aloes. It's a rare food item, almost non-existent in the eastern continent but abundant in the west, especially in elf lands, as they don't eat meat. The problem was the long journey by carriage, not to mention the risk of noble attacks. Renya remembered the teleportation gate Hond had mentioned, which they could use, though it required 30 magical stones per use. Renya and Frau had tried to produce as many as possible. Before leaving, Renya apologized to Frau for asking her to look after the house in their absence. Upon reaching the teleportation gate, Hond was already waiting for them. He reminded them that the gate's limit was one person with their luggage. He had already reported to the other side, so they should follow the instructions given there. As they stepped through the teleportation gate, a girl welcomed them to the land of the fairy folk. She introduced herself as Crowell, from the Star Academy, and would be their guide. Renya stepped forward, introduced himself, and expressed his pleasure in meeting her. He then turned to Shaun and Lorna, urging them to introduce themselves, as it would be impolite not to. Shaun then realized the problem, she was surprised Renya could speak the language of the fairies. Lorna admitted that they didn't understand a word the girl was saying. They asked Renya to introduce them to Crowell. Just as Renya was about to ask if they were joking, Kikiso stepped forward to greet Crowell. Kikiso turns back to ask Renya if he doesn't notice any difference between ordinary language and the language of the fairy tribe. Since that's the case, she offers to interpret for Shaun and Lorna. Renya realizes that this must be because of the language proficiency skill he acquired, which automatically translates everything for him. Lorna steps forward to praise Kikiso, calling her amazing. Kikiso laughs loudly, stating it's only natural since she's a talented merchant. Then modestly, she adds that these skills are simple, and it would be difficult if she couldn't speak the languages of the lands they visit. Without pause, Kikiso turns to introduce Shaun and Lorna to Crowell. Crowell suddenly changes her attitude, saying it's better to be with Kikiso than with those humans. Crowell asks Kikiso to interpret for her, as she has no interest in using the inferior human language. Renya is puzzled by her sudden insult towards everyone. Crowell focuses on her expertise, introducing the city they are in as Grand Cane. Although it's not as big as the city they live in, it's an important trade city with a variety of goods. The magical power of the fairy tribe is much higher than that of humans, so magic here is highly developed. Particularly in exploiting the potential of magic stones in infrastructure, irrigation, and shields. Thus, when monsters appear, they are not too difficult to repel. Renya inquires about trying the local specialties, aloe seeds and ELF beans. Crowell informs him that these are abundantly available in the market. When they arrive, Renya is surprised by the taste, which is exactly like Japanese miso soup. He never expected to taste it in another world. Renya wonders if the creator of this dish is also a wanderer like him. While they are still chatting, a young man covered in wounds falls off his horse. He tries to convey an urgent message with his last breaths. Fortify the city, the labyrinth forest is overrun by thousands of monsters heading this way. Crowell apologizes for the emergency that has just occurred. She regrets to inform them that the tour must be postponed. After leading everyone to a safe room, she leaves. Renya thinks that since she said that, they shouldn't act on their own. He turns to ask if anyone knows what the labyrinth forest is like. Shaun explains that the labyrinth forest is not only found on this continent, but it also exists in the human inhabited lands and other continents. Deep within the forest is a path leading to a vast underground dungeon. 
All four continents have separate entrances to this dungeon, which is home to many monsters. Shaun adds that the forest is so vast it connects to the forest near Kakuria. However, she has never heard of a monster outbreak happening there. That place has never had any monsters strong enough to cause an incident like this. After a while, Crowell returns to apologize for making everyone wait. According to the forest guard's earlier report, she has confirmed a very serious incident has just occurred. Due to this incident, she can no longer allow everyone to stay here. About 20,000 monsters have been detected inside the forest. And while everyone is talking, they are marching towards the city of Grand Cane. All 200 guards in the Labyrinth Forest have been annihilated, having fought hopelessly against the enemy's encirclement. Crowell urgently states that based on the distance, it will take only 4 to 5 hours for them to reach the city. The total number of soldiers here is about 500, with an additional 200 if fully mobilized. With that number, they can't possibly stop such a formidable enemy force. She has sent an urgent request for reinforcements to the capital, but it will take at least a day. All she can do now is buy a little time for the citizens to flee. Therefore, Crowell asks Renya to take this time to bring reinforcements from Kakuria. Then she changes her mind, asking him to destroy the teleportation gate linked to this place. Renya questions her about the defensive magic she mentioned to them earlier. Against such a large number of monsters, it might only delay them. Lorna, horrified, asks what everyone's plan is, hoping it's not a suicide mission to protect the city. Crowell assures everyone not to worry, though just a trainee, she has been trained as a reserve soldier. Renya prepares to take everyone away, from the beginning, they had no obligation to help the people here. Shaun asks Renya if he really intends to do that, as she doesn't want to abandon everyone here. Lorna tells Shaun that they have no right to interfere in this place's affairs. Everyone starts to leave towards the teleportation gate. Kikiso approaches Renya, asking if she could have a private word with him. Upon leaving the others and entering a forest, Kikiso starts her conversation with Renya. She comments on their misfortune, having encountered a battle so soon after their arrival. Then she mentions an intriguing business idea. She asks Renya to consider if the ELF people would owe them a favor if they sold a bit of kindness. Before she can finish, Renya cuts her off, uninterested in hearing more. He asks what she means, questioning if she wants him to help those people. Kikiso hesitates, admitting that's somewhat her intention, but it's a bit different. Impatient, Renya urges her to speak plainly, as he doesn't have time for games. Kikiso gets to the point, asking what he would do if he had the power equivalent to a 20,000-man army. Renya comments sarcastically on a merchant's ability to assess others' capabilities. He states that even if he could defeat many, it wouldn't impact the overwhelming number of monsters. He believes that even killing 1,000 would be insignificant given their vast number. Kikiso understands this is currently impossible for Renya, but only if he fights with his sword. Renya counters, asking if she means using magic instead. Regrettably, all he can use is simple holy magic. Kikiso acknowledges this but proposes a deal, she'll teach him magic and ways to combat a large army. In return, he must use his newfound skills to save the ELF people. If the town is saved, her business would flourish and Renya could take as many aloes as he wants. She adds that abandoning the townspeople would be hard for him. Renya remains unconvinced, asking her to stop her pointless talk. He refuses to risk his life for strangers and insists that slaughtering 20,000 monsters is out of the question. Kikiso, still hopeful, agrees with his words but believes he has the strength to accomplish this without risking his life. She persuades him to remember how he created many magic stones to afford their trip. This also proves that Renya possesses an immense amount of magical power. Though it might sound unbelievable, even top-tier mages can only create a few magic stones per day. Kikiso knows that a brief explanation like this might not be immediately understandable, but the truth is Renya's magical power far exceeds that of a top-tier mage. Hearing this, Renya takes a moment to think and then urges her to quickly tell him about what she's talking about and how to use it. Renya returns to Shaun and Lorna, announcing his decision to stay and join the ELF people. Lorna, in shock, asks why he would want to stay. Renya explains that his reason for coming here was for rice, and he won't leave until his objective is achieved. Agreeing to leave now would also mean losing the chance to get the rice. 
Moreover, it wouldn't hurt to have the ELF people owe them a favor. After hearing Renya out, Shaun, about to say she wants to join, is stopped by Renya's understanding of her intention. Renya states that only he and Kikiso will go to the battlefield. The two of them should stay and be ready to return to Kikuria at any moment. He instructs them to head back to Kikaria and destroy the teleportation gate if he doesn't return or if the monsters reach them before his return. They must return to Kikuria at all costs, even if it means abandoning the city. Shaun loudly insists on fighting, unable to abandon them. Renya says that even if she joins the fight, it won't help. He understands her feelings, but now is not the time for heroics. Renya asks Shaun to consider what's more important, the ELF people or Kikuria. He wants her to be mindful of her position and the current situation. Shaun, softly, acknowledges Renya's words, expressing her frustration but agreeing to do what she can. Lorna remains fearful about Renya going to the battlefield. Renya reassures them that escaping alone wouldn't be difficult for him, but protecting the place is uncertain. This is why he asked them to handle the task. Before leaving, Shaun keeps asking him to save the people there. At the battlefield, the captain of the Grand Cane Guard is commanding his soldiers to reinforce the magical barriers. He is extremely worried about the overwhelming number of monsters and wonders how to overpower them. When Crowell sees the two returning, she is surprised and asks why they didn't leave as she had earlier instructed. Renya doesn't respond to her but asks who is in command here, as he wishes to meet them. Upon meeting Skuld, Renya hands over all the magic he can muster. That amount, added to the barrier, should at least hold them off for a while. Crowell explains to him about the city's barrier. It's set around the city and acts like a trap, attacking anything close to it. But this time, they are only using the barrier around the defensive area and strengthening the traps. As the traps hinder the advance of the monsters, they plan to use bows and magic to eliminate as many monsters as possible. The main purpose of this defensive line is to slow down the enemy's advance. Renya asks Kikiso what she thinks, finding it convenient for their operation. Since the ELF people are only focused on dealing with the monsters and not paying attention to them, it gives them an advantage. Soon after, the monsters approach the ELF's previously set barriers. Skuld commands everyone to activate the barrier, and the mages present simultaneously touch the ground and pray. The monster commander also senses the barrier and wonders if it's the renowned magic of the forest used by the ELF. He curses loudly at his troops, questioning if such small traps could stop them. The ELF mages feel the enemy's advancing pace slowing but realize the monsters are using brute force to overcome their traps, rather than cautiously looking for signs. Skuld yells, urging everyone to make the despicable monsters regret trespassing on their sacred land. Despite their efforts, the monsters don't stop, nor show any signs of panic. Skuld grows suspicious that someone might be manipulating them from behind. Regardless, their mission remains to hold the monsters back as long as possible. Observing the situation, Kikiso signals Renya that it's time. Their focus now is solely on holding back the monsters. She guides Renya in an advanced magic technique to create tornadoes to attack the enemy. She guesses Renya might also be compatible with wind magic. Kikiso mentions she recently read about this magic in some ancient texts she accidentally acquired. She has modified the technique a bit to match Renya's strength. Step by step, Kikiso instructs Renya, while Crowell watches the unusual winds appearing. Upon seeing the tornado created by Renya, Crowell is bewildered and wonders what he intends to do. Kikiso continues to instruct that if the tornado forms 20 kilometers above ground, its temperature will be minus 700 degrees Celsius. The ELF warriors fighting stop and watch the tornado move towards the monsters. Suddenly, Renya loses control of his mana, causing the tornado to turn back towards the ELF people. Kikiso panics and yells for everyone to quickly erect magic shields to block it. During this chaos, Renya is also in danger, but Crowell quickly steps in front of him and uses a magic shield to protect him. After the tornado passes Renya, it hits Kikiso. Renya yells, questioning what kind of power that was, and says he was almost killed. Kikiso angrily retorts that Renya is the one who used too much mana. She blames him for not knowing how to reduce his power, and counters his accusation. A soldier reports to the captain that the tornado has destroyed half of the monsters with just one attack. 
Despite the heavy loss, the monsters decide to continue their assault. However, Renya's tornado has damaged the ELF's barrier. With no other choice, Renya charges forward to find the monster army's commander. The demon race commander, upon encountering Renya, mockingly thinks he's just a strangely dressed ELF, only to realize he's a human. Renya ignores his taunts and simply asks if he's the leader of the monsters. Renya also confirms that even after losing half his troops, the commander is still there. Renya knows that losing half the forces so futilely is already a defeat. The commander laughs, dismissing the loss of half his troops as a defeat. He boasts that as long as he is unharmed, the pawns are expendable. He then questions if Renya thinks the ELF people can defeat him. The commander laughs, saying he's still alive, and as long as he crushes the city and its resistance, he will have succeeded. Renya sighs, thinking he was dealing with an intelligent demon, only to realize he's just a loud, empty vessel. The demon agrees to fight Renya, claiming to be generous, and wants to teach Renya that no matter how hard he tries, he cannot defeat him. While the two were still conversing, the demon suddenly launched a surprise attack on Renya from behind. He easily dodged it, the sword strike was similar to Amiru's. He was certain that the blade had been magically enhanced, and any contact would be lethal. To the demon, this attack was just a warm-up, but he would acknowledge Renya's skill if he could avoid the next strike. Tired of the demon's ramblings, Renya took the initiative to attack. The demon, observing the sword that just struck him, was clueless about its nature. He was enraged that his armor was severed by an ordinary sword. Renya, unaware himself, thought if the demon was curious about the sword, he could ask its previous owner. Renya also realized that it was thanks to the armor that the demon remained unaffected by the whirlwind. His arrogance was fueled by the wind blade and the armor he wore. Renya finally understood that the demon's weapons and armor were of high quality, which is why the ELF tribe's attacks hadn't hurt him. In reality, he was just masking his own weakness with all his gear. The demon's face turned sour, but Renya didn't stop there. He pointed out that the demon always calls others weak, but in truth, he is the weak one. Renya had thought demons were strong, but it seems he needed to reconsider. The demon, now thoroughly enraged as Renya had hoped, lost control and was easily defeated. As the demon called for help, his monsters scattered in groups. The ELF tribe, still celebrating, saw Renya return from the forest with the demon commander. After the battle, Crowell personally cooked for the four of them. Shaun was puzzled by Crowell's outfit. Renya calmly explained that in his hometown, it's customary to dress like that when cooking. Frau, the little girl, looked at Crowell and felt the strength of a wife. Shaun immediately added that the way Crowell spoke only added to her charm. Lorna realized they had no choice but to be left behind. Renya didn't pay attention to them and focused on his meal. It looked and tasted just like Japanese rice. He wouldn't have to worry about food anymore. Shaun, puzzled, thought it was just aloes and ELF beans. After quelling the monster outbreak, Renya was taken to the capital of the ELF kingdom. It was then that the three learned Crowell was of royal blood. Initially, Renya had sensed her extraordinary etiquette compared to ordinary citizens. The prince, representing the kingdom's leadership, thanked Renya. He acknowledged Renya's help in repelling the attack and minimizing casualties. No one was seriously injured thanks to Renya's cooperation. The prince first wanted to express gratitude for this, and moreover, they had captured the enemy leader. The prince hinted at rewarding Renya. Renya internally thought he couldn't accept anything further as it had all started from a misunderstanding. He straightforwardly told them he came for rice and oil and wanted to learn how to produce them. Renya also asked if the prince could share any local specialties. The prince pondered and mentioned they were expanding the kingdom's territories, so it wouldn't be a problem for Renya to govern one, with the condition of returning it upon his demise. Renya was displeased, he didn't need such complications as his place was already chaotic enough. Mismanagement would only lead to more trouble. The prince was surprised Renya declined the land offer and instead wanted agricultural knowledge. The prince agreed to Renya's request but on one condition, he must take the prince's daughter with him. Renya flatly refused. The prime minister, standing nearby, furiously demanded why he dared reject the king's offer. Renya sighed, noting the royal family needed protection, and questioned if it was wise to let someone like Crowell go outside. 
The prince explained Croel was 35th in line for the throne, with slim chances of succession, and family members rarely had opportunities to travel abroad. The prince then used Rice as leverage, leaving Renya no choice but to agree to take her along. Kikiso, after completing her mission, returned to report to her master. There were no issues in resource distribution. Eridora was gradually reviving thanks to the resources sent with Renya. Everything was unfolding as they had initially planned. The deity laughed loudly, pleased that everything was proceeding as expected. According to the intelligence, a new artifact had been collected. The deity pondered for a moment and then asked, as usual, summoning someone required the permission of the goddess. She inquired if Kikiso knew anything about this. The deity abruptly praised the food from there as being really good. Setting that aside, she wanted to know if Renya would properly use his new abilities. Kikiso frowned, saying it was hard to say. It seemed Renya had been using it unconsciously without knowing how to control it. But if this continued, Renya would become unbeatable. By overdoing everything out of habit, Renya's magical power would surpass normal understanding. The deity reluctantly said that fortunately, Renya didn't like using magic, and it's best to leave him as is. She could handle it now, but if he lost control, she couldn't guarantee anything. Suddenly, she yelled at Kikiso, saying her job as a guardian deity was to protect everyone, so she better keep an eye on him. Kikiso covered her ears, thinking to herself how troublesome this was, blaming the deity for the world state. After arriving at Renya's house, Kroel got along very well with the little girl Frau, who cooked many delicious dishes. Frau, excitedly looking at the freshly cooked food, wanted Kroel to teach her more delicious recipes of the fairy tribe. By now, Kroel had also learned to use human language. It had been a week since Renya and his team returned. Frau was surprised to hear they would now live with someone from the fairy tribe. But since Kroel was kind, Frau had tried to teach her human speech. Thus, Kroel could now understand everything people said. Frau admired the learning ability of the fairy tribe. Frau and Kroel brought the newly cooked rice to Renya. After Renya received it, Frau shifted her focus, wanting to ask Kroel a few things before she lived there. Frau boldly asked how she felt about their master. Kroel replied that Renya had saved her life and she would give him anything he wanted. The next thing Frau wanted to know was Crowell's opinion of the house. It was her first time visiting a human's residence, but she noticed everything was very clean, and everything was meticulously cared for, showing the house was well maintained. And so, the two gradually understood each other better. As usual, Renya would go to train with Renya, while inside the house, Crowell taught Frau how to make many new dishes. Due to the excessive amount of mana Renya currently possessed, he wanted to learn some new spells. The shopkeeper handed him a glass orb. It was just an illusion, a crystal ball that didn't glow, requiring only a bit of power. Surprisingly, when Renya touched it, it exploded, shocking everyone. The shopkeeper angrily asked if he was trying to blow up her shop, reminding him she had told him to use only a little mana. Renya innocently responded that he indeed used only a bit of mana. The shopkeeper continuously wondered how his magical power had reached such a level in just a few months. Even a genius mage practicing for ten years might not achieve that. She wanted to confirm whether Renya had any contract with demons, noting that people lost in modern times are usually not normal. Renya denied it, attributing his prowess to diligent practice. The shopkeeper brought out a book, asking if he was compatible with wind magic. She said it was difficult in the past, but with his current mana, he could freely use magic. Renya inquired if he could learn more, having only recently learned storm formation. She hesitantly suggested it would be better to learn in sequence, eyeing Renya as a worthy investment and deciding to choose a spell that suited him. After leaving the shop, Renya returned home and found Riaris waiting for him. She shared with him about A. Z. Hond's recent confession to her. However, A. Z. Hond, being a secondary member of the Hond family, seemed to have left home to become an adventurer. For someone like Riaris, a commoner without a surname, it was hard to reciprocate such kindness. She felt their relationship was disproportionate to the Hond family. He had reassured her not to worry about that, but it was just because he was a good person. Therefore, she wanted her achievements as an adventurer to be recognized. Only then did Renya realize how significant an adventurer's achievements were in society. Shaun, 
sitting beside them, expressed disdain for the management system here. He then suggested to Renya that it could be an opportunity to gain wealth and fame. Renya thought to himself that what Riaris needed at that moment was confidence, not achievements. Renya asked Riaris how she planned to earn her achievements. Hearing this, Riaris listed several missions she had found. Renya sighed after a quick look, noting they were all trivial tasks. However, everyone paid attention when Riaris mentioned the final mission. Inside Hermit's tomb, they discovered a wyvern nest and were asked to deal with them for a considerable reward. Renya and the group decided to help Riaris. Counting the wyverns flying in the sky, Renya estimated there were about 14 or 15. He suggested a surprise attack, but it was clear they had already been spotted. After observing them for a while, Renya noted they didn't seem very agile. He asked Riaris if she was really okay with him taking the entire reward this time. Riaris felt it was fine, as she wasn't strong enough to handle this task alone. Renya, after further observation, decided he would take 50% and the rest could divide among themselves. As Renya was leaving, Shaun called out, thinking something was amiss. Renya cut him off, assuming Shaun wanted to show off his training results, confident he could surpass Crowell. Shaun, amused, told him to just watch. Crowell, behind them, thought Shaun was too naive, knowing what Renya was up to but still falling for it. Shaun, still laughing loudly, told everyone to watch out, promising to surprise Renya. Renya, no longer paying attention to Shaun, asked Riaris if she remembered the special abilities of the sword. Although he used it well, he wanted Riaris to get familiar with it too. After giving instructions to everyone, Renya focused on hunting the wyverns. He concentrated his mana on his feet, imagining lifting off the ground and activating it. However, he still hadn't adjusted his power correctly. Renya silently cursed, struggling with this during the fight. Everyone below was horrified as they watched Renya, who was nearly attacked by a wyvern while still unstable. Sensing danger, Renya imagined a shield under his feet and chanted a whirlwind spell inside it. Once stabilized in the air, Renya silently beckoned the wyverns. He used his sword to kill each one flying towards him, the best way to handle them. As Renya thought, using a lot of mana felt different. Crowell, observing from below, scolded Renya for being crazy, wondering why he charged straight at them. Shaun curiously turned to Crowell and asked if she could do it too, given her specialty in magic. Crowell resignedly admitted that Renya was too skilled in wind magic and his combat style was powerful, with increasing mana. Only Renya could cast spells quickly without incantations. Crowell also took out her bow and started attacking from a distance, which was her way of fighting. Shaun thought to herself that Crowell was controlling the arrows with wind blade, and the two were fighting in perfect harmony. Shaun didn't just watch, she also joined in the fight. During a moment of carelessness, she almost died, reminding herself to be more careful. After the attack, Crowell complimented Shaun on her improved strength. A sword was useless against flying enemies, but Shaun had managed to bring one down. Shaun replied that it might be due to her training process, fortunately having learned how to fight wyverns earlier. Shaun reminded herself not to be careless again. Seeing Ryris still afraid, Renya told her that she and AZ were facing similar battles. They couldn't keep being handheld forever. He asked Ryris if she wanted to stand tall before the Han family. Ryris thought that she was once an adventurer, and her purpose here was to fight. She wanted to prove that even Ryris could defeat a wyvern. Though she lacked Crowell's archery skills and Shaun's strength, she had never been able to approach them from the beginning. But now, with Crowell cutting off their venomous fangs, she had a chance. Wyverns often attack head-on, and observing the surroundings, Ryris decided to move forward. If she fought there, the falling rocks would crush both people and beasts. Her current task was to wait for an opportunity to strike and dodge their attacks. Spotting a wyvern approaching, she aimed for its head and slashed down to its feet. Ryris was delighted that with her mithril sword, she could slice the beast. She just needed to gradually bleed it out. Shaun and Crowell kept an eye on her from afar. Shaun noted that behind Ryris was unprotected, and if a wyvern crashed into the rocks, it would be bad. Shaun suggested that there were only two more left, they could kill one more and then take a break. Shaun said they had helped Ryris as much as they could. Even though they had come together suddenly, they were now a team. 
Crowell stated that what mattered now was Ryrus's feelings. Ryrus, facing the wyvern, kept encouraging herself, knowing she just needed a bit more effort. She couldn't stop thinking about her memories with Az Hond. She was happy to know his feelings, but felt unworthy as a commoner compared to the Hond clan. However, Az Hond didn't want her to worry about that, as those people weren't important to him. Just as Ryrus gathered the courage to charge forward, Renya appeared and killed the last wyvern. He walked toward Shaun and Crowell, complaining about the chaos, still not used to running in the air. Noticing the expression on their faces, Renya realized what he had done and wondered if it was his fault. They informed him that it was the last one and Ryrus was about to kill it. Renya awkwardly stated that they had completed the wyvern mission and couldn't take all of them back anyway. He found Ryrus and told her she could now show off in front of Az Han's friends. Ryrus hesitantly said it was difficult for her, apologizing to everyone. Renya asked if they could choose a new mission, right? Shaun informed him that there were no more missions, which was why they had chosen this one. Moreover, not many strong monsters appeared around Kukuria, and the appearance of wyverns was already strange enough. Suddenly, a black dragon appeared behind them, commenting on their liveliness. Crowell, confused, thought it was extinct in the north. Renya, after a brief talk, decided to fight, seeing it as a worthy opponent. As Renya engaged the black dragon, a mysterious voice echoed, noting that Renya always charged straight into battle. The girl asked if Renya could talk to her privately for a moment. Shortly after, a girl appeared, expressing her joy that he was still well. Renya asked who she was, as he had never met her before, but the voice seemed familiar. The girl smiled, revealing that they had met before, she was Amiru. Renya, hearing this name, immediately thought of the shape-shifting demon. He questioned what the girl in front of him was talking about, as that demon was clearly male. Amiru assured him there was no mistake. Shaun, puzzled, asked Renya if she was someone he knew. Hearing Shaun's question, Renya then remembered that she had been unconscious and unaware of what had happened at that time. Renya stated that Amiru was the demon they had encountered in the cave that time. After speaking, he paused for a moment, pondering the person standing before him. Clearly, she was from a magical race. Although she appeared human, her immense mana clearly indicated she was not. Her power was greater than any race he knew, and he had never seen such a weapon before. Renya asked why she claimed to be Amiru and why she brought a dragon with her. Annoyed, Renya questioned if this was her way of repaying for the last incident, commenting on her distasteful disguise as a woman. Amiru explained that her previous form was just for work, this was her true body, although it was still a disguise. Renya, unable to tolerate Amiru's actions, drew his sword to her neck. Amiru pleaded for him to lower his sword and promised to explain everything. Renya remained skeptical, not believing Amiru was a girl. Amiru clarified that her previous body was just borrowed, and she had merged her soul into it. After that incident, she had to return her soul to the central continent. But it took some time to create a new body, so she had to wrap herself like a mummy until now. She asked Renya if he didn't find her shape-shifting impressive. Renya bluntly said he thought she was more of a pervert. He questioned her intentions with her current body, asking if she planned to fight. Amiru believed her current body was very convenient and expressed her desire to live with Renya. Everyone was astonished and speechless. Renya, staying composed, said he didn't understand what she was talking about. Amiru shared that she was currently in a bit of trouble and had to leave home. She promised she wouldn't cause more trouble and would abide by human laws. She also brought Renya a gift, the dragon they had fought earlier. Renya once again picks up his weapon, laughing loudly. No matter what, he must defeat this dragon. Amiru, feeling a headache coming on, doesn't know what to do. Since the dragon was originally a gift for Renya, she feels she has no right to object to whatever he decides to do with it. Renya thinks it's more convenient this way, keeping a dragon by his side would just add to his troubles. He only needs to bring back its corpse to make explaining the mission failure more understandable. Unexpectedly, when Renya raises his sword, the black dragon continuously begs for mercy. Amiru explains that the dragon is too slow, which is why it was left behind. It's so cowardly that it bowed its head and offered to become her subordinate. It was like this even before she caught it, probably because it sensed Renya's magical power and reacted accordingly. Renya, skeptical, 
asks the black dragon if it's just pretending. Hearing the question, the dragon bursts into tears and replies that it wouldn't dare. Amira comments that with such a massive amount of magical power, no dragon would dare to oppose Renya. Renya asks her if she heard him correctly, looking at the dragon in this state, who would want to fight anymore. He turns his back, preparing to leave, declaring he has no need for such a useless creature. Before leaving, he reminds Amiru not to harm humanity. Amiru stops everyone, saying the matter isn't resolved yet. She still has many other talents, from metallurgy to tentacles. When Renya says he doesn't need them, Amiru brings up the mission he's on, suggesting she might be able to help. After a moment of thought, Amira decides to make the black dragon a pet to accompany Riaris, thereby resolving the issue. She thinks no human could possibly possess a dragon knight. After saying this, Amira removes the dragon seed from the dragon's head. To humans, it's no different from a common magic stone, but the magical power within it is extremely valuable. The quality of each stone depends on the individual dragon, making them rare and precious. Renya thinks it sounds a lot like DNA. He tells Amiru he understands. Amiru uses the dragon seed on Ryris just as she wakes up. Ryris asks what happened, mentioning they came here to hunt wyverns. Before she can finish her sentence, she screams upon seeing the black dragon. Renya informs her that this black dragon will be following her from now on. Amiru also says that from now on, Ryris will be its master. Renya thinks that with this development, Amiru is probably not his enemy. He tells Shaun and Crowell that it looks like they'll have a new roommate. Crowell, living with a demon race, seems a bit uneasy, but it doesn't matter to her. If Renya has no problem with it, then neither does Amiru. Renya tells Ryris to have the dragon take everyone to Kakuria. He's looking for a way to show the nobles Ryris' abilities, and with this dragon, it will be easy. The dragon flies into the city of Kakuria, attracting the attention of many people and soldiers. It's only when Ryris steps down from the dragon that the crowd's fear and confusion diminishes. A young man, waking up, realizes he doesn't know where he is. The deity explains that this is the soul realm at the edge of the world, the Garden of Eden. The deity regrets to inform him that he has passed away. He asks again to confirm that this is indeed the Garden of Eden and that he is truly dead. After sitting for a while, he recalls being stabbed to death. To this day, he still can't accept that he's dead. The deity tells him not to panic, as she will now grant him a new life. She is a deity from a different world, one of the five pillars supporting the ruling god. She is also the god's supervisor, more precisely, a diligent goddess. She informs him that he will become a hero and hopes that he can save Eridora from the cruel hands of the demon king. He asks if it's like a game, like he will become a hero with overpowering strength. She says he will receive special skills to give him an advantage in fighting the demon king. He laughs, saying those skills sound like cheats. If he's to be a hero, he needs really good skills. First, a hero must master swordsmanship and magic. And in this world, he also needs skills to communicate with the people. Then, when the hero enters the battlefield, he will need the power of a saint to increase the strength of those around him. He doesn't quite understand what she's saying, but it seems good. The deity emphasizes that this is all he will receive. He thinks it's not beneficial for him at all, he has a better cheating skill he wants to use. All this level grinding and relationship building is too complicated, it would be better if the people there absolutely obeyed him. The deity reluctantly grants him the skill he desires. Despite her immense impatience with the person before her, she tries to stay calm. After all, a hero is humanity's hope in adversity. Watching him being revived, the deity only hopes that someone as worthless as him can make a difference. Outwardly, she calls him a hero, inwardly hoping for the day he saves the world. Upon arriving at Renya's house, Amiru chooses a room in the basement. Renya, puzzled, asks why she didn't choose one of the many rooms upstairs. Amiru explains that it's easier for her to conduct experiments downstairs. The smell of chemicals and the screams of lab rats won't escape from there. So, this place might even be better than her previous cave. Renya, having nothing more to say, tells her to stay there and heads back home. Shaun informs Renya about the resurrection of the Demon King. To counter the Demon King, the Holy Kingdom has summoned heroes from other realms. These heroes arrived two months ago but seem reluctant to leave the capital. 
According to Lorna, they are incredibly depraved, or in short, perverts. After being summoned, one made a demand for all the beautiful girls of the Holy Kingdom and neighboring countries. His reputation is now lower than dirt. Furthermore, despite his immense power, it seems he has no intention of taking any action. Renya, upon hearing this, reminds Shaun to stay away from him. She asks if he remembers where her holy kingdom is. Renya recalls it as Triden, a country like a snow barrier against the demon king. Indeed, Triden is the second strongest kingdom after the holy kingdom in the eastern continent. Thus, they will be the first to face the demon king's assault. Shaun asks Renya if he knows who leads that kingdom. The ruler of that land is not a king, the head of Triden is Duchess Lydia Femme Fatale. And that means she is also Shaun's mother. She looks at Renya, who doesn't seem surprised by this news. He had vaguely guessed it, he just didn't expect her to be the daughter of Lydia. However, he still doesn't understand why Shaun became an adventurer. Shaun has three younger sisters, unlike her, they are all very intelligent. Shaun's siblings are all involved in politics, helping their mother and maintaining excellent relations with the military and the populace. Compared to them, since childhood, Shaun preferred outdoor activities over desk jobs. She wanted to interact and fight on the battlefield, not really fitting the role of a princess. Everyone, including herself, agreed that her younger sister should be the successor. However, Shaun still wished for her sister to become the duchess. Sadly, as the eldest child, she was in the way of her sister's succession. That's why she had to leave home with Lorna and go to Kukuria. Shaun asks Renya if her story sounds too pathetic. Her mother and sister probably still keep in touch with Lorna. Renya silently thinks how difficult it is for families to stay united after such events. Shaun apologizes for hiding this from him, believing that with his personality, he's someone she can trust. She always waited for the right opportunity to tell Renya. He says her past doesn't affect their relationship now. Even he doesn't remember what kind of person he was in the past. Today, she has a reason for sharing this. The heroes must have heard of Shaun's name somewhere, which is why Triden is currently trying to find her to hand her over to them. Although Renya promised to help her with this, the next morning, Shaun and Lorna secretly leave. They leave behind a letter, which Renya finds. In it, Shaun asks for forgiveness for leaving without a word. After hearing her story and even receiving an offer of help, she was very happy. However, it's still a matter for her kingdom, so she can't shift her responsibility onto others. If Shaun accepted Renya's help, the trouble would eventually fall on him. Therefore, she decided to resolve this herself. She hopes everyone will continue their journey without her. After reading the letter, Renya is furious, scolding Shaun for always complicating things. Crowell finds him, she has heard about the situation from Frau and feels indebted to Shaun. Shaun's sudden departure makes Crowell very sad. Frau, standing beside, tears up, feeling it's unfair for Shaun and Lorna to leave like that. Having lived alone until her master and the others came, Frau understands their feelings. Frau wants Renya to go and rescue Shaun. Renya responds that it's obvious he would do so, he doesn't need to discuss it. Frau is pleasantly surprised by his reaction, having thought Renya wouldn't care. Renya, now visibly annoyed, scolds that everything always has to be one way or the other, and now he has to go and clean up the mess. Not getting any rest, he now has to drag Shaun back and reprimand her. With such a weak will, how could she handle his daily tasks? Frau softly remarks that in reality, Shaun is the one who's suffering. Seeing Renya leave without another word, Frau runs after him, asking where he's going. Renya replies that he has some things to take care of first and will be back soon. Meanwhile, Kikiso, in another place, is extremely frustrated. Every location she finds is blocked by firewalls. At this point, it seems the only way to reach the world's admin area is through the summoning system. This means she must sneak into the castle in the capital, which is heavily guarded. The more she thinks about it, the more she wants to curse the deity in charge of this place. Picking up such trash, the summoned hero is even more repulsive than the demon king. She had just managed to get more manpower for her work, and now it's all being wasted on this. Despite being kind-hearted, Kikiso feels she has her limits. She might be angry, but she has no right to interfere with the hero. It's beyond her authority, and cleaning up after him is exhausting. 
but leaving it as is would waste precious resources. Finally, Kikiso decides to ask them for help. Renya finds Amiru and gives her car blueprints, thinking it wouldn't be a problem for her. He explains that he's actually lost, and the notebook contains inventions from his world. Those things were originally made and operated using complex mechanical machinery. But here, they have something convenient like magic. Renya believes creating it in this world would also be simple. Amiru studies the notebook, noting how pressure is compressed by burning fuel. Renya watches Amiru's changing expressions, skeptically asking if she can do it. Amiru excitedly says she's never seen anything like it before. Amiru has never been more eager to research and innovate. If she could improve the car to run on magic, she's sure to create something extraordinary. After building the car, she and Renya quickly set off to find Shaun. Amira laughs, pleased to have such a vehicle. Renya, feeling uncomfortable, asks why it's so bumpy. They need to cross mountains to avoid detection, Amiru explains, and despite her efforts to adjust the suspension, it's still rough. Amiru struggles with the steering, telling Renya to stop complaining and use magic to fix it if he's so bothered. Renya asks if he's hearing things or if there's a noise coming from the engine. Amiru suspects the engine cylinders are damaged. Renya is alarmed, wondering if it's safe to continue as the noise grows louder. Amiru thinks it's fine since she increased the cylinder count in the engine to add more magical power, a clever idea. However, balancing the magic among the engines is challenging, and the cooling system is makeshift, powered by magic. As they stop talking, the car also comes to a halt. Renya, skeptical, questions if the car is reparable, noting they don't have many spare parts. Amira checks and finds the engine cylinders completely shattered. Renya agrees with Amira's earlier thought, if they want to save time, this is the only way. He stops complaining and asks how far they've traveled. Amiru calculates that they've been traveling at 80 km per hour for about 40 minutes, but it's hard to estimate the distance since she used a lot of magic. She decides to adjust the system to prevent further damage to the car. Currently, they're using magic as fuel, so they need to fine-tune the magic usage. Renya mentions that things like gasoline don't exist here. Amiru remarks that the science and technology of his world are amazing, but her noble family's magic research also has its merits. Combining them would surely create something fascinating. She excitedly imagines traveling freely without worrying about fuel, a dream come true for a researcher like her. A servant informs Shaun that they are nearly at their destination. Shaun tells Lorna they've finally arrived, and she will prepare to meet the hero. Lorna looks at Shaun with tearful eyes, unable to speak. Shaun tells Lorna not to look at her like that. She's heard the hero is a huge pervert but thinks it's just a rumor, maybe he's actually a charming gentleman. She's also heard he praised her beauty. Reflecting on her travels with Renya, Shaun wonders if she has become any stronger. Lorna, feeling helpless, says Shaun's reckless and strong-willed nature remains unchanged. Shaun thanks Lorna for being by her side during this time. Lorna admits that keeping up with Renya is challenging, but she feels genuinely happy spending time with Shaun. Meanwhile, Amiru and Renya arrive at humanity's largest city, the capital. According to a trader they met near the border, a spaceship had arrived there the day before. Renya is sure it's the ship from the kingdom of Triden, as such a vessel isn't something ordinary people could own. The likelihood of them reaching there before Renya and Amiru is very low. Amiru, realizing they're running out of time, wonders what Renya plans to do. Even following his plan now is dangerous, so she suggests they should track the ship first. Seeing Renya's silence, she turns back, asking if he needs a break. Renya admits he's not fully recovered but insists they don't have much time left. If they don't find them soon, it could be dangerous. Amira scolds him for his stubbornness, noting they don't even know where the ship landed. The best course of action might be to ask around the docks or local people. Shaun has now arrived where the hero is. Everyone around her pities the poor princess. Lorna thinks everything here is over, she might leave for Triton the next day, leaving Shaun behind for the sake of her kingdom and her duty as a princess. Suddenly, there's a call outside. Lorna, sword in hand, cautiously goes to check. She's surprised to find Amiru and Renya outside. Amiru, still smiling, didn't expect Renya to be so tricky, but luckily they guessed correctly. 
Lorna asks why they're here and how they got there. Renya questions Lorna's intentions, knowing well what her cunning mind is thinking. Clearly, she knew this would happen, which is why she asked Shaun to tell him everything. Renya is still frustrated that he now has to come here to fetch the foolish Shaun. Disguised, Renya and Amiru storm into the hero's quarters and start attacking him relentlessly. The hero praises Renya's swordsmanship. Shaun, not recognizing the masked duo, only feels a sense of familiarity with the swordsmanship. Soldiers rush in, asking the hero if everything is alright. The hero shouts about intruders and orders the guards to call for reinforcements. A soldier then protects Princess Shaun at the back. The hero, weapon in hand, demands to know what the two intruders are doing and to reveal their identities. He is furious that they have dared to barge into his room and swing their swords around. When no one responds, he angrily questions why they are silent as clams. Amiru shouts back, calling him a fool and reveals that the man before him will become the ruler of five continents, a demon who will lead all tribes. Everyone in the room is terrified at the mention of the demon king. Renya joins Amiru in insulting them, though he notes that his hair color might make others think he's a demon. The hero calmly asks what the demon king is doing here, then thinks if he defeats the demon king now, he won't have to join the troublesome conquest later. He fantasizes about having the public pay him in every possible way, considering it a lucky day. The hero laughs loudly, seeing it as killing two birds with one stone. Amiru, watching him laugh non-stop, wonders how this man can be the hero of humanity. She thinks it's not bad to come here with Renya, they can learn a lot. They had already planned this, Renya would pretend to be the demon king so they could enter the hero's room without fear of being recognized. Lorna feels relieved, thinking if this works, other races might also be saved. But she dreads the consequences if they make a wrong move. Renya asks if their plan is working, admitting he's not good at acting as he said earlier. Amiru assures Renya it will be fine, as he's no different from a demon king anyway. She tells him to leave everything to her, the charming demoness. Lorna pleads with them to take care of and save Shaun. Renya, putting on his mask, says that's exactly why he came. He instructs Lorna to head to their rendezvous point and leave the rest to them. The hero, currently boasting in front of a crowd, believes the advantage is his. Amidst the fight, Renya easily snatches Shaun and flees. Amiru loudly declares that the princess now belongs to her. To their surprise, the hero chases after them. He blocks their way, exclaiming it's crazy for the demon king to flee during such a critical moment. Renya didn't expect to be pursued. The hero comments on the convenience of Renya's teleportation and levitation abilities. He's irate that Renya is trying to escape with his woman. The hero raises his sword, declaring that he will eliminate the demon king at this moment. He laughs, thinking he has roasted the demon king, as that was no ordinary sword strike. Amiru, laughing, questions if that wasn't a normal sword strike. The hero, resting his sword on his shoulder, wonders why they don't just die. Amiru realizes that he intends to kill them along with the princess. Teleportation, levitation, and lightning strike, all are considered advanced magic even among humans. She can't keep using these moves repeatedly. The magical strength he possesses compared to Renya's skills worries her. The teleport ability is troublesome, and Renya can't easily wield his sword while carrying the unconscious Shaun. Below, a large number of archers are being summoned. Amiru turns to Renya and says she will handle the hero, as Renya is occupied with Shaun. With a sly smile, Amiru faces the hero, ready to show her expertise in magic. The hero, underestimating her, scoffs at the idea of a girl daring to fight him. Amiru tells him to shut up as she activates a dual spell. Suddenly, the sky brightens, and a tentacled monster and a swarm of bees attack the hero. Escaping with Renya, Amiru boasts about her personal collection of creatures. Renya, worried, asks if leaving the monsters in the city is safe, fearing they might cause destruction. Amiru tells Renya not to worry, as the people here will be fine. With the hero's strength, he should easily handle the situation. Besides, the chaos they've caused will distract everyone. Now everyone is preoccupied with the demon king attacking the hero and the summoned demon wreaking havoc in the city. All the city's forces will converge there before the beast can destroy the city. Kikiso, wearing a hooded cloak, 
quietly commends Renya for causing such mayhem, making it easier for her to act. She quickly heads to the tower to find the hero summoning location. Kikiso laughs, ready to deal with the troublesome overseer after enduring so much. Meanwhile, the hero focuses on fighting the monsters attacking him, not realizing that the trio has already left. He curses under his breath, vowing to encounter them again. The four of them return to Kukuria in the car driven by Amiru. Lorna, sitting in the back, keeps screaming, asking what in the world this is. Amiru gleefully explains it's a creation from Renya's world, called a car. Lorna repeatedly asks Amiru to stop for a break, but Amiru refuses, insisting they need to get as far away as possible, ignoring Lorna's complaints about feeling nauseous. Amiru calmly monitors the car's decreasing magic power, reminding Renya to infuse more mana into it. They continue driving non-stop, and when they finally pause, except for Amiru, the others are nauseous and vomiting. Amiru praises Renya for his abundant mana, which significantly improved the car's performance. She thinks they will reach Kukuria after a few more stops. Renya notes that they've traveled quite a distance from the holy city, and it seems they are no longer being pursued. Shaun, waking up, asks where she is. Renya informs her they are on their way back to Kukuria, curious why she isn't more relieved to see them. Realizing the assassin in the Demon King costume was Renya, Shaun acknowledges that what happened wasn't just a hallucination. Renya asks if she's still feeling unwell due to the perfume's effects. Amiru suspects it's not just the perfume but Shaun's reaction to the incident in the city. They managed a quick impersonation of the Demon King, forcing the hero to leave the castle. Amira teases that they had to rescue the dear Princess Shaun from the clutches of the Demon King. Shaun repeats Amira's words about the beautiful princess, seemingly trying to come to terms with the situation. Renya asks if she's struggling to accept it. Amira suggests letting Shaun process the events on her own. Lorna points out that if rescuing the princess was their goal, the hero could now freely roam outside. Shaun is unsure, but it seems the hero wasn't really concerned about her. Amiru proudly talks about the three smoke bombs she threw at him during their escape, each containing a different poison, ensuring his suffering. She boasts that these are an advanced version of demon toxins developed by Frau and that human medicine couldn't possibly treat them. Amiru adds that she doesn't need to do anything further since that's the hero's nature. Even if healers cure him physically, they can't remove the toxins, leaving him full of rage towards the demon king. Amiru suggests they should maximize this opportunity, as defeating the demon king is also the hero's mission. Renya is relieved that Amiru isn't a demon anymore and agrees that as long as their plan works, there's no turning back. Shaun approaches to thank Amiru, acknowledging her misunderstanding from the incident in the cave. The four of them continue their journey home in the car, with Renya contemplating the tranquility of the moment. Soon, the second princess of Triton visits Renya's house to express her deep gratitude for his care of Shaun. She wonders why Shaun and Lorna are here after being kidnapped by the Demon King. Renya, turning to them, asks who leaked this information. Shaun exclaims that she's not that foolish, she's been staying indoors to avoid any trouble. Lorna says she didn't reveal anything either, just reported on Shaun's situation before returning. Renya sighs, realizing Lorna inadvertently caused this. Shaun explains that her mother forbade her from going to the holy city due to unresolved tensions between them and the city's leaders. She also mentions that war seems inevitable and that unfortunately, the Duke of Triden is uncooperative. Additionally, half of the duchy's lords agree with offering Shaun to the hero, which she finds unwise given the current political strife. Renya asks Shaun about her decision to go to the holy city. Understanding the core issue, he invites them to discuss it further. Even if they hide here, the second princess acknowledges that it's only a matter of time before they're discovered. Upon seeing the three emerge, she asks if it's true that Shaun was captured by the Demon King, as reported. Renya reveals that he is the Demon King, clarifying that he only played the role. The second princess asks Shaun if this is true. Shaun tells her sister that she was unconscious and unaware of the events but affirms that Renya is a decent person and a wanderer. The second princess asks again, so it was Renya behind all this. She clarifies that Triden has no intention of punishing the demon king, or more accurately, Renya. She tracked her sister's location through a signal from her hairpin, confirming Shaun's presence here. 
Despite knowing Renya's involvement in the events at the Holy City, Triden won't pursue the matter as it happened within the Holy Kingdom's jurisdiction, over which Triden has no authority. Renya doesn't deny his involvement, asking if he and Shaun are considered enemies of Triden. The second princess straightforwardly confirms this, stating that as the mastermind, Triden could have handed him over to the Holy Kingdom, but she thinks that would be foolish. She expresses her desire not to die here and is confident that the Holy Kingdom didn't want things to unfold this way. The hero has consistently rejected requests from both sides, embarrassing the Holy Kingdom. The second princess even heard he's training intensely to defeat the demon king and has summoned leaders from neighboring countries for a discussion. She believes the hero will act soon. Furthermore, Shaun's safe return is her greatest concern.